views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight we present the debate for the Democratic primary in the 14th Congressional District, which includes sections of the Bronx and Queens. It's the first of five weeks of political debates here on BronxNet. We'll get you the full list and the full schedule right at the end of our program. In our 25 plus years of political debates on this program, this is the first time we're conducting one virtually for obvious reasons. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. The primary is on Tuesday, June 23rd, and all eligible voters are urged to vote. Uh, candidates, uh, let's uh, name each one of the, the four candidates who are on the primary ballot. Uh, the first is uh, former CNBC anchor Michelle Caruso Cabrera. Nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me. And uh, the incumbent is Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Thank you, Ms. Ocasio Cortez, for joining us. Always a pleasure. A mother and uh, the controller at Sobro, the president of the Jalalabad Association, Badran Khan. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. And a publisher and elite level chess player is uh, Sam Sloan. Mr. Sloan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Our candidates in tonight's debate, I will direct a question to one candidate, and that candidate will respond, and then we'll have a free flowing dialogue that each candidate can participate in, with the original respondent having the final say on the question before the next question is asked. Please remember that each candidate will need to be recognized before they speak. At the end of the program, each candidate will be given the opportunity to deliver a one-minute closing statement. Please note that tonight's questions and topics include those submitted by the candidates themselves. I do want to add uh, one, uh, I think, very important note, a personal note. I know Ms. Khan and her family has wrestled with uh, very, very seriously with the uh, coronavirus, and I want to wish her and her family well. I will tell you personally, my family also has been very uh, uh, directly affected, and uh, I don't know directly about other candidates, but we have all been affected and I think it's uh, worthwhile for us to all express uh, sympathy and condolences where necessary and also hearty get well soon wishes to all of our Bronx and Queens uh, constituents and neighbors uh, during this very very difficult time and you know we're, we're going to talk about some very important issues but I don't think any of us will uh, uh, ignore the fact that we're in the middle of this very serious crisis so anyway candidates uh, let's get to it uh, by prior agreement the first question will be addressed uh, to uh, Ms. Um, Caruso Cabrera. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Gary, thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for doing this. And a huge thank you to all the essential workers out there who are still working to keep us safe. And, and of course, if anyone who's watching has lost a loved one during this terrible pandemic, my, my sincerest condolences and our prayers are with you. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you very much. Let's start with political ideology. Each candidate here is running under the uh, banner uh, of the Democratic Party to be the Democratic Party's nominee for the 14th Congressional District in Congress. What are the values of the Democratic Party that you support and how will you pursue them in the next congressional term? And if there are values you don't support, let's address those as well. I'll throw out just a, a couple of historically um, uh, championed uh, issues by Democrats like universal health care, uh, environmental and economic justice, and things like that. Let's talk about the, the Democratic Party and uh, your participation uh, in, in the party in this race. Gary, I, I got into this race because I'm the daughter and the, de uh, and the granddaughter of immigrants. Uh, immigrants long championed 
by Democrats. You know, when my family came here, they had all the typical jobs of recent arrivals, you know, the overnight shifts, waiting tables, washing dishes. My father's parents, they worked in the meat packing industry, which is still dangerous today. My dad was one of the first in his family to go to college. He went to what he called the commuter college, which meant he drove or he took the train. That's where we met my mom. Her English wasn't perfect. She sure was pretty. And I tell you all that because when I went off to college, my dad was so proud that I was going to a sleepaway college, a school with dorms. And he was so proud to know how far his family had come after his father had only gone to the seventh grade. But even when I went to college, he made sure when I came home, he wanted me to work in, in jobs that he knew many and most Americans, that's how they make their living. I was a waitress at Pizza Hut. Someday I'm gonna write a book. Everything I ever needed to learn about life, I learned at Pizza Hut. And he also had me do physical labor one summer where I worked at uh, as a landscaper. And at the time I thought he was crazy, but I understood pretty quickly because I got home exhausted every night and I thought, wow, in the fall I get to go back to school. But these guys, I was the only girl, they have to do this every day. It's exhausting. What if they get injured? What if they get sick? They don't get paid if it rains, if it snows. They don't get paid. And those are lessons that have always stayed with me. And those are crucial core values of the Democratic Party, thinking about the vulnerable. And that's why I'm running in this race, because I want to help the people here in Queens and in the Bronx to achieve the same American dream that I've been able to achieve after my grandparents and my mother came to this country. Thanks Thank very much. You. Thank you very much. I do want to mention to the candidates, I can see each of you, so if you raise your hand that you're, I'm assuming everybody wants to participate in this, um, uh, in this question, but if you do have something you want to add, just uh, note, note it to me and I'll make sure that you get on. Then let's uh, go to you, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, you want to talk about democratic values? Of course, and thank you so very much again. It's always uh, an incredible opportunity to be here and to speak to our community. You know, the question was, what is the Democratic Party? What do we fight for and what do we believe in? And this has always been at the core of my entire tenure um, so far in my first term in Congress. I believe unapologetically in 21st century economic, human and social rights, uh, an agenda of racial justice that, that makes sure and guarantees that every American has access to opportunity and dignity at work. That means I believe that healthcare is a human right. I believe, especially now that we're seeing in this pandemic, that healthcare should be guaranteed to every person in the United States of America. I believe in a living wage. I believe that no person should be too poor to live and to be paid a wage less than their ability to pay for rent, uh, again, rent, food, health care, and more. I believe that education is a human right. And then college should never be out of economic reach. And in fact, I believe that public colleges and universities should be tuition free, much like they were and much, much like they were in the past. Our CUNY system was already there and we have slowly escalated the cost of living outside of what's even tenable for working Americans. I didn't waitress as a summer job or have a, a, you know, a high school job. That was my life. I'm a daughter of a domestic worker. My mom cleaned houses and I did homework on other people's staircases growing up. And I was a waitress until two years ago uh, when I had the great honor and the great privilege of being selected by our community to serve as the youngest woman ever elected to the United States Congress. And I've taken that spirit and made sure that we pushed the Democratic Party, not just accept the status quo, but push to make sure that we are that we are guaranteeing an environmental future, an economic future, and a just future for all Americans, including our immigrant community here in New York City. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Khan. Uh, you will be next. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, just want to say to all everyone who's out there who's suffering from the coronavirus, whose family, I, my heart goes all to you. 
because uh, we had a pretty, we had two deaths in my family and my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, both in the hospital, but thank God uh, they're doing much better out. So I wanna give uh, everyone who's suffering uh, my condolence to everyone. So as a, uh, I am a daughter of uh, a Bangladeshi immigrants. My both parents traveled in the 60s and they came in and they started small businesses. So that's what I am. I grew up in the small business world uh, I was a waitress, I was a dishwasher. After school, we went in, but my parents taught me the core of being a Democrat, who we are, what we are, what we can do, it's how we can help the people. That's what we always um, taught us since I was a child. I remember, and because I grew up in the Lower East Side, every time anyone needed help, my parents were there. Anyone who migrated from Bangladesh didn't have a place to stay. We had a two bedroom apartment. I think it actually was 1.5. And if people would travel, they would like, you know what, if they don't have a space to stay, they would come into our house. So we would give them like the living room and we would share because they didn't have a place to, to put their head or somewhere to sleep in. So we would actually help them to get on their feet. So I would ask them when I was a child, mom, what is the help between that? It's like, because you know, when people migrate, we need to push them to see where they can go, give them a job, very small jobs in the space because my parents had small restaurants and my both family, everyone worked together, but they made sure I had an education. They made sure my, my family went to school and that's where a value happened. Everyone needs to help everyone. Nobody should be left behind and that's why i really believe in the universal basic income that we need people to get out of poverty last weekend i went sunday yesterday and it was so sad in the bronx in uh, 211 holland avenue there was almost 600 people online for food and that is so sad i mean thank you for ICNA and thank you for open house association for helping giving the food out but it's increasing i started about four months ago with them and every day that's increasing and we need to get these people out of poverty. We need to create more jobs. We need to help these people. How can we help them? Universal basic income is something that I'm standing for because I think it will give them some sort of income so they could actually, we, we have a drastic difference between everyone's income. And I think that needs to change now. And I want the future of Democratic Party to be stronger and to help one another, and especially my people in Queens and in the Bronx, you know, we're out there for you. We want to help everyone and how can we do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sloan, same question for you. Mr. Sloan, are you with us? Yeah, my name is Sam Sloan. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm absolutely the opposite of these other people. Uh, Ms. Caruso Cabrero, uh, you get the final word on this if you'd like. I'm, I'm curious, um, my opponent AOC made very clear all of her priorities, and yet what I don't understand is why AOC is always MIA. At the height of the crisis, she stayed in her Washington DC apartment with the Whole Foods in the lobby and didn't come home even though Congress wasn't in session. She did that for a whole week. Why on earth would you do that when there's a crisis going on here? When you're the representative, me, day one, I was out delivering food, I was out delivering masks, I wasn't even elected. I've been throughout the Bronx with masks since day one, and you get away in your apartment. And see, you're always MIA. You're too. All of these things that you talked about, you haven't achieved and you have driven huge traction within the Democratic Party. Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, presumably you have something you want to um, respond to that. And then Ms. Caruso Cabrera, you'll still get the final word. Sure, of course. Thank you, Gary. I'm proud to say that I'm the most present member of Congress that has ever, I would say, that has served in the seat rather in modern history. Um, and I take an enormous amount of pride in the fact that virtually every time Congress is out of session, I am here at home. I have personally raised uh, close to half a million dollars for our district and our community for food pantries and deliver and deliver meals myself every single week in Lafrac City, Allerton, etc. Now the the you know the the grief I suppose the grievance that uh, Ms. Cabrera Caruso Cabrera apologies has is that I spent several days after one vote in March uh, in my apartment and the fact of the matter was was that I wasn't feeling very well. And I wanted to take a few days. 
And uh, I'm proud to say that we continue to have a strong field force on the ground. And this is the benefit of, of being a movement candidate. Again, I've continued to raise over almost half a million dollars for food pantries, delivering meals myself, while also advocating for broader systemic change in Washington. Thank you. Well, uh, you get the you final word. Thank you. 25,000 jobs. That's the least you could do after driving away $27 billion in tax revenue that we could have had. Imagine if we had those jobs that you drove away right now to help us get back on our feet. All right, thank you very much. You were in your apartment. You told everyone you were in the Bronx. You said so in Spanish. Completely uh, fought. Hello. Hello to everyone here in the Bronx. Okay, you so Spanish to people. Why? What? Let, let's move on to the, the next question, because the next question I have is about jobs. And so let's address uh, that directly. Um, so this, uh, according to our uh, prior agreement, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez gets the next one. Um, unemployment in New York and across the country has shattered all records, obviously, as the pandemic eases over time. What's the best path to generate those jobs and get people back to work? It is so important that we understand exactly how serious this situation is uh, economically and in terms of our public health, especially in the context of COVID-19. What we have seen and what we are going through is an unprecedented economic crisis unlike any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. And even as many of these states try to go back against the advice, try to reopen against the advice of public health experts and others, one of the things that we need to understand is that even if we snapped our fingers and reopened tomorrow, there are still going to be millions of jobs that will not immediately come back. And so what we need to do is make sure that we return to New Deal era style policies where we have huge investments, direct investments in jobs, not crony tax breaks, not corrupt deals for real estate developers and Wall Street CEOs, but direct investments that spur small businesses immediately and making sure that we invest in infrastructure projects, rebuilding our schools, cleaning our air. And frankly, we knew that a crisis like this was coming. If it wasn't going to be coronavirus, we knew that there was going to be an enormous, uh, you know, that climate change in and of itself, whether it's Hurricane Sandy or others, present enormous economic crises. And it was with that foresight that I had the privilege and the honor of working with Senator Ed Markey in making sure that we co-authored one of the most progressive and wide-ranging uh, wide ranging infrastructure and jobs projects, the Green New Deal, that was endorsed by virtually every presidential candidate this cycle. We need to make sure that we have direct investments and that demand can, must be spurred uh, in order to kickstart our economy and create millions of jobs. All right, thank you very much. We will address the um, environmental uh, issue on another question. I want to stay with the jobs question. Ms. Khan will allow you to respond, and then I'm sure Ms. Uh, Caruso Cabrera has some thoughts too. So Ms. Khan, your thoughts about the jobs and what's the best way to regenerate them during this crisis? Well, right now, uh, our uh, job loss is almost 1.7%. It's increase is worse than the Great Depression. Uh, since February, the job loss, we lost almost 20 million jobs. And this is, a, this is a very sad for, especially in my district. And I think how we need to maintain and bring these jobs back before we could go back and open the city. We have to make sure that we are safe to go back. That's a, a very, very important thing because just going back and going back to work, it could be unsafe. We have still, we need more testing. And the second thing is the small businesses. I think it's a big factor in both uh, uh, Queens and the Bronx. And the, the small business has not been getting enough funding. So how do we even get these people to come back on? Most people will not be able to reopen. That's how the worst is happening. I have not only grocery store, the small, like the uh, salons, the uh, eyebrow places, uh, people who, who rent um, chairs. It's how do we bring these people back is what we have to do. Not only cooperation, our backbone is the small businesses in this, this uh, District 14. How can we support the small business? The mom and pop didn't qualify for any SBA loans. 
I have tried to help people to see if we can get loans. They didn't. And that's what I think we need to emphasize. We need to invest in our small businesses. We need to make sure the small businesses don't have to pay rent when they're shut down for almost four months. Grocery opened yesterday after four weeks. He's like, I can't survive. My staffs are not eating. And that's when we need to invest in our small business. That's the backbone. And special, we need to make sure Wall Street and everyone with the higher corporation mandate people to go back to work and hire these people back. I think that should be the main emphasis. Laying off people and not hiring them back is what we need to make sure we do. Thank you, Ms. Caruso Cabrera. Unemployment here in Queens and the Bronx as a result of the pandemic is, is really horrific. It's way higher than it is in the rest of the United States. I estimate at least 30%. And right around the corner for me, San Rafael Church, every Saturday, it's got to be a thousand people in line, mostly immigrants who worked in construction, nail techs, people who cleaned houses or hotels, and they are desperate to get back to work once it is safe. So that's got to be job one. And I, as a business reporter, who covered economic crises all over the world. I've seen this before, and I know it's going to take. First, we need a real attitudinal shift about jobs. We can't tell job creators, go away. No, we don't want your 25,000 jobs. I'm never going to do that. Plus, you got to vote for PPP to small businesses. My opponent, AOC, voted against the stimulus bill. She voted against coronavirus testing. She voted against hospitals and she voted against money for small businesses. Those are jobs. I was just in Westchester Square this past week and they were very pleased to have received those PPP loans, many of them. And they had already done all kinds of things to keep people working. One store owner told me he had an old life insurance policy that he forgot about, he took out a loan against it to keep people employed. People, small business owners, if they could, they've done everything they can, but they needed extra help and they got it through the PPP, but not because of my opponent. She voted against it. She voted against health care, she voted against coronavirus testing, and she voted against small mom and pop businesses. Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, you have the final word on this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gary. You know, I think if any small, you can ask any small business owner, especially those in Queens and the Bronx, the reason I opposed PPP is because it is structured to benefit Wall Street, the wealthy and the rich. And it is not structured in a way to optimize outcomes for small businesses. And anyone who reads this legislation can see how toxic there were, there were. And they were holding hospitals hostage, holding funding hostage so that the Lakers, so that Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, and so that Shake Shack could get bailouts. There are some small businesses that receive PPP. But you go to our community and you will see how many small businesses were denied, were left hanging out to dry. Oh, and by the way, you know what else is in that pill, bill? You know what I actually voted against? A half trillion dollar, uh, no strings attached, Wall Street bailout for Steven Mnuchin, Donald Trump, and all of their friends. And that kind of corruption and the tolerance for it is unacceptable, which That's is not why you voted against it. By the way, that just, first just voted bill, against it to be the only bill, one. That the first first bill, ones. Ms. Cabr Caruso Cabrera will give you a chance to speak. Just raise your hand. I'll make because if you interrupt, it, it is chaos. Okay. So right, just right. raise your hand. I'll make sure we're not looking to cut off any debate or okay. dialogue. So let her finish and then you'll get your chance to speak. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Gary. By the way, that first bill cut out immigrants, ITIN payers, and it cut out American citizens married to immigrants. Now, I know Ms. Cabrera may find that acceptable, and I know that she may think that that's a good deal, but in a district that is 50% immigrant, I will never, ever leave our immigrant families behind. It is unacceptable to me. Okay, Ms. Caruso Cabrera and then Ms. Khan, go ahead. And then Ms. Ocasio-Cortez will have the final word, go ahead. You're the only Democrat who cares about immigrants because you're the only Democrat who voted against it. You did that 
then you could get your name in the headlines. That's what you always do. You're always working on your celebrity status. No deal, no bill is ever perfect, but we had to start somewhere and we had to move quickly. Once again, you're always fucking the party. You're divisive and you work against the party. Rather than working for unity, which is what we need right now, especially if we need to win, if we're going to win in November. Uh, Ms. Khan, you wanted to say something, and then you will get the final word, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. Presumably, you want to respond to that. Go ahead. So I, I have a question. Is the, the small business is what we are trying to see. The people who have, a, like, a, like I said before, the mom and pop, who don't have a 941, who don't have, they're just a family working through it. Those are the people who are, who are really hurting the most because they can't prove all these paperwork. And that's what we are trying to help these people. So why in the bill, we didn't have something or a section of it saying, you know what? We need to have these people help them because you know what? Not every corner store has all these paperwork and they, it killed these people. I have people like Badrun. So I, I tried all these other grants, Facebook gave a grant, uh, these, all these small grants. So I try to help them to see what can we get if they don't qualify for the PPE, they didn't qualify because they couldn't manage all these paperwork. So we need to make sure a bill comes out in that sense to help these mom and pop businesses because it didn't work. And I can name at least a hundred businesses in both of our district, Queens and Bronx, that did not get any funding. And they, yeah. Uh, Ms. Ocasio Cortez, you get the final word on this. Thank you so much. And, you know, Honestly, I know she may be my opponent in this race, but Ms. Khan really said it. We know that this legislation was not set up for us to win. And that's why, you know, our district is one of the most progressive districts in America. And we know that power in Washington and established power is not just about left and right. It's about up and down. And there is an enormous amount of pressure it to, to conform in Washington. And yes, a lot of times I will stand up and say we can do better. And sometimes that means being a lonely voice. But our constituents called me and I listened to our office because I don't take and I listen to our community. I don't I'm not financed by multimillionaires and bank CEOs. I'm financed by small dollar everyday people. And so do you want to know something, Gary? On the eve of that of that stimulus vote, I had more calls coming into my office saying to not support the bill rather than to support it. Our community knew we were getting a raw deal. That's what they told me. And because I am, am a loyal to our community, I took that input and did my job and represented them, represented their view on the floor of the house even though, even though it sometimes means standing up to the most powerful people in the country. What we'll do, we'll take a break. We can, I know Ms. Caruso Cabrera wants to continue it. I would like to move on to a different subject, but we'll take a break. We'll reconvene and then we'll uh, start right after uh, we come back. Uh, you're watching the uh, Democratic primary in the 14th Congressional District debate, and then uh, we'll be right back. Okay, back with you on uh, Bronx Talk for the uh, Democratic primary debate in the 14th uh, Congressional District. And uh, just continuing the dialogue, uh, Ms. Caruso Cabrera had something to say. Let's do that quickly. We'll get a response and then we'll move on. Uh, my opponent, AOC, said she had received many, many calls before that stimulus vote. I don't know how that's possible because her office is never open. Office, she never opened an office actually in her district in the Bronx. And the one that she did open, I drove past last week and it was closed in the middle of the week. How are you getting calls? AOC, uh, you're let's, always lying. Let's let her respond to that and then let's move on. Thank you. Sure. Um, I know Ms. Uh, uh, Caruso Cabrera isn't from the district, so she may have some trouble finding her way around. But um, I believe she visited my campaign office, which is not right. my professional office. Oh, and both. then secondly, um, and then secondly, I have had two operating offices. My Bronx office is co-located with Assemblywoman Karines Reyes due to the extraordinarily high cost of rent. But I am happy to, to say that our office has set a record in that we have received two congressional uh, awards, the first, uh, the first in history where a freshman office, um, and we share that honor with Congresswoman Donna Shalala, 
uh, the first in history where we have received two of these congressional uh, awards for congressional operations in innovation and, and culture. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have successfully resolved, we've reunited families, we have uh, answered thousands of calls. As a, as a strong voice in Congress, I receive up to 3,000 calls per day, and every day we screen every single one of them to prioritize and answer our constituents first. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Ms. Khan, uh, obviously healthcare has always been a priority, but in the middle of this pandemic, it's been raised considerably on yes. the priority scale. There are a range of proposals and possibilities. I will list just some of them. Obamacare, single payer, universal, private base, public option, Medicare for all. What plan can be realistically achieved in the next session? And what plan would you advocate for in the House of Representatives? I want universal health care. And but I also do want to keep the private uh, the private insurance on the side, and that's what my, I'm trying to do. With the universal health care, everybody has a right to have their health care. So if people don't have health care, they could do the public option, they could do the uh, Obamacare, but also the private should be on the side. Because right now, with this situation right now, everyone should be able to get health care. Because with the COVID-19, people are getting sick, people are not getting enough medical treatments, and that we need to pass this law right away that everyone who's with, with any health issue with COVID-19 should, should get health care. And if anyone is laying people off, I would ask anyone from the companies to at least give them six to eight months of health insurance so these people who don't have health insurance have not have a problem of getting enough medical health care. So I'm basically for the universal health care and giving public options to people. Thank you very much. Ms. Cabrera, your thoughts? It, it's very clear during this pandemic that we have not spent enough on our public health system. It was incredibly stressed and is still very stressed. Uh, in the early days of the crisis, going by Elmhurst Hospital and seeing the lines out the door of people waiting to be tested, um, potentially getting sick from just being in the lines, it was horrible, horrible to see. So we need to spend more on public health. Uh, we need, my principles are always accessibility and affordability, and we do that through choice. Medicare for all is not the answer. Medicare for all is about taking health insurance away from people who already have it. Union members who have very good health insurance and actually gave up salary to have those benefits. That's what Medicare for all is about, about taking away their health insurance, something that's incredibly disruptive. And it's no panacea. Italy, Spain, they have pretty much Medicare for all and thousands and thousands of people died there wasn't enough spending on health care. That's what we need to focus on, improving our public health system so people have accessibility and affordability. And the other thing I would never do, I would never vote against 75 billion for hospitals, 25 billion for coronavirus testing, like AOC did when she voted against that bill. She claims it's because she cares so much, but she was the only Democrat to do so. She did it because she was always trying to get her name in the headlines. She wants to be a celebrity, not a representative to the people here in Queens and in the Bronx. I just want to be your humble representative and work every day for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. I believe that healthcare should be guaranteed in the United States of America. And that is why I support single payer Medicare for all in the United States. It is the one system and it is the one policy that we know can actually guarantee health care. And the reason that that is so important, health care is so important, is because words like accessibility and words like access to and words like choice are, are big pharma lobbyist code words because the reason we talk about, they say access and choice is because everyone has access to buy a thousand dollar a month healthcare plan. Everyone has access, even when I was a waitress two years ago, I had to use the Obamacare exchange. Obamacare is an enormous improvement on what there was before, which was nothing. But at the end of the day, I had to pay almost $200 a month for an $8,000 deductible on a waitress's salary. And do you know what that means? It means you don't go to the doctor. 
So what we really need to do is, is really try to move towards systems like also Canada, South Korea, the UK. And I believe that in terms of our possibilities for the next term, which was also the question that you asked, Gary, what is possible for next term? That is one of the reasons why we are working together. When people say divisiveness and all of this stuff, listen, not all Democrats are the same. Some Democrats believe in not protecting immigrant rights. Other Democrats believe that we should subsidize big pharma and healthcare corporations. I'll be very honest about that. But we can come together too. We will have our differences. But that's also, you know, that's also the reason why I speak with Vice President Biden and try to push and try to see what our possibilities for our next term are. And in that, I believe that we can continue our fight and try to make sure that we mobilize everyday people to guarantee health care in the United States of America, because the folks that are left behind in the cracks are the same essential workers, Uber drivers, domestic workers, home health care aides. And by the way, yes, unions support Medicare for all because it is wrong. It is wrong to give up your wages because there's we only have employer spot. Our primary system is employer sponsored health insurance in the United States. And in a time of 30 million people suddenly unemployed, I think we all realize how broken our current system is and the fact that employer dependent health care and health insurance rather is one of the least stable uh, one of the least stable systems that we could have. I do not believe in expanding that system. I don't believe in even subsidizing it. I believe in changing it. Thank you very much. Let's keep our, um, I, I know that Ms. Caruso Cabrera wants to respond and Ms. Khan gets the final word. Uh, let's just uh, keep our uh, uh, comments a little shorter so that we can fit more in. Uh, Ms. Caruso Cabrera, you wanted to uh, add something to that. Medicare for all does not guarantee health care. That's what we saw in Italy and Spain, where thousands and thousands, particularly the elderly, died because even though they had health insurance, they didn't get health care. And my opponent, AOC, says she's working to help Joe Biden, but she told New York Magazine that she groaned out loud because she's in the same party as Joe Biden. In any other country, she said they wouldn't be in the same party. She's right, because she's not a Democrat. She's a Democratic Socialist and she's working to divide the party like she did last time. And she continues to do every day. Do you, do you want to respond to that before we just conclude this uh, question, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez? Absolutely. Well, I'm very happy to have the support of my colleagues in the New York delegation. I'm very happy to work very, uh, very well and collaborate a lot with our fellow members. In fact, I have co-sponsored hundreds of bills, many of which have become law with both Democratic and, believe it or not, Republican colleagues. I make my views known. And I'm not afraid to fight for what I believe is the right thing for our constituents. And while some people may call that divisive, I believe that I work very closely with our colleagues. And by the way, I think that it's just called clarity. I don't, I don't poll test what I believe. I don't change my beliefs. And by the way, I, I may be, aside from Ms. Khan, the only person in this race that actually has policy positions on their website. I commit to stances. I commit to our district. And I don't go around and run based on how awful Ms. Khan may be or how awful Ms. Caruso Cabrera may be. I'm not running based on how neg on negative, you know, right. stances on them or tearing them down. I'm running based on building our community up. Thank you very much. Ms. Khan, you get the final word on all of this. Yes. Uh, so, as I said, I believe in the universal health plan and I believe in not eliminating private insurance, but also we need to negotiate the most worst thing is prescription prices. That is insane right now. And just to give you an example, I spend $64 on, uh, on eye drop. So I think that what we need to afford, how we, we can reinvent the entire system with the, uh, with the deductibles, with the co-pays, we need to work on that so everyone and, and who is right now don't have insurance, work with everybody to get health insurance. And that's what I want for the people. And that's if you go onto my website, you will see my policies on health insurance. Thank you very much. Ms. Caruso Cabrera, studies are underway linking uh, peaker plants and air pollution with the incidence of COVID-19. Let's talk about the proposed Green New Deal. I suppose on the environmental protection scale, the Green New Deal is on one end 
and the Trump administration's elimination of uh, dozens of EPA regulations, or on the other end, is a massive policy package that would remake the U.S. economy and eliminate all U.S. carbon emissions realistic, doable, and ultimately the right way to go at this time? Uh, no, the Green New Deal is another example of a divisive policy that actually doesn't achieve anything because you can't enact it, actually. If I were in Congress, what I would be working on are very specific things to help the district. Seawalls to protect the waterfront, where we have so many communities that are dealing with flooding, like Edgewater Park, for example, that could use help. Specific things that will make a difference with climate change and not these kind of policies, which are once again about trying to divide the Democratic Party. You know, she's always proposing things that drive the party apart. Don't pay your rent. Don't go back to work. All of this while she's MIA. All of these things while well, at the height of the crisis, she stayed in her luxury apartment in DC with the Whole Foods in the lobby, so she didn't have to worry about where she was gonna get her food like the rest of us. Okay, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez is next, and Ms. Khan, and then uh, Ms. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Ms. Cabrera gets the first, the final word on this. Let's try to uh, tighten it up here so we can uh, move forward. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, and in fact, I'm proud to be an original author of the Green New Deal. And by the way, didn't do that alone. I did it with the mentorship of the, one of the greatest uh, climate leaders in Congress, Senator Ed Markey. And by the way, you know, people talk about divisiveness. It was my first piece of major piece of legislation that I had dropped. And we have over a hundred uh, Democrats co-sponsored onto the Green New Deal. Now the Green New Deal is a framework. It's a framework informed by our lives here in the Bronx and Queens. It's informed by the fact that the Bronx has some of the highest childhood asthma rates in the country. And that is an environmental equity issue. Our air is being dumped on, our water is being poisoned. NYCHA in and of itself is an environmental crisis, with, crisis which by the way, is why I followed it up with unprecedented infrastructure bills in the Green New Deal for public housing, which would make sure that we that we retrofit NYCHA buildings, clean the air, strip lead from paint and water, and make sure that people have a basic human right to clean air, clean water, and an equitable environment to live in. I am proud to say that yes, I do introduce innovative, bold new ideas that maybe people at first glance may find surprising, but guess what? I stay at it. And I'm happy to say that I have been named by Vice President Biden and by Senator Bernie Sanders to the Unity Task Force to make sure that we draft the democratic platform on environmental issues and climate change for the next term and for the future. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Okay, so let's see. Fighting for climate change is very important, what I believe in. That's what I believe in. That's what I think our district believes in. And actually, the younger generation, uh, I have uh, two kids and one in high school, one in uh, college. They're both involved in these things. One thing I want to say, the Green New Deal is a little bit unrealistic because it talks about wind, it talks about solar, but it doesn't talk about the nuclear energy. And I think we need to incorporate that in the nuclear energy because that's 50%, if I'm not mistaken, is a, a carbon-free energy. We need to put that into that deal if it goes through and how Ms. Ocasio-Cortez is doing that. It's, I'm saying is if we involve that, it could be a better deal. And I think we should separate it than other things. We should make it only one. And we should also sign the, the Paris treaty. That's important. We need to go back and we cannot fight climate change ourselves. We need to get China. We need to get India. We need to get all these countries to get involved because once we get involved, we could collaborate this and work together. But the Green New Deal I sell is a goal. I don't know if we can make that goal. I don't think that's so realistic. So we need to make bill. We need to put in legislative where it could work right away. Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, let's do that quickly. And then Ms. Carissa right. Cabrera gets the final word. Of course, I'd like to thank Ms. Khan for actually talking about policy in this debate. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you bring up an important uh, element of our energy mix, which is nuclear. 
And this is absolutely a critical, uh, a critical part of, of this conversation. And so uh, one thing that I, that I would just like to clarify is that the Green New Deal does leave the door open for nuclear. You are right, we name renewables like wind and solar specifically. The door is open for nuclear, but we also have to make sure that community input and the, and the technology is vetted. I do believe that there is a, an open door there. Um, and in terms of the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal is a resolution. It's a statement of frameworks and values upon which climate policy should be drafted. Because the last thing we want to happen is for oil barons to turn into solar barons and for energy workers to continue to be marginalized, pay less than a living wage, and put in dangerous conditions where their lives are at risk. Thank and you. So, thank you. OK, uh, Ms. Caruso Cabrera, go ahead. Uh, my opponent, AOC, calls her legislation bold. It is, in fact, ineffectual. It is silent on China and India, the greatest polluters in the world. And we could do everything, everything right here in the United States. And it will have no impact unless they change their ways. And I'm very interested to hear her talk about the air and the water because she always said about her predecessor, he doesn't drink our water, he doesn't breathe our air. And yet she does the same thing. She doesn't come home. AOC is MIA. She wasn't breathing the air here when she stayed in her apartment for a full week, her luxury apartment in D.C. with the Whole Foods in the lobby at the height of the crisis when Congress wasn't in session. She's the one not breathing our air or drinking our water. We'll take a short break. You'll get a response and we'll move on. Folks, we're uh, uh, going to take a short break. This is the Democratic primary debate in the 14th Congressional District. We'll uh, take a break on uh, BronxNet television. We'll be right back. Okay, back with you on the uh, Democratic primary debate for the 14th Congressional District. We're in the middle of a dialogue, uh, and uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez wanted to respond to that. Uh, yes. Yes, you know, thank you. And uh, while it's disappointing to see Ms. Caruso Cabrera fixated um, on personal attacks and for some strange reason obsessed with the six days in March that I wasn't feeling well um, and had to stay in my apartment, I do think it's quite funny uh, that she goes on and on about the fact that I have to live that, frankly, that I spend time in uh, doing my job in, in Washington and coming home to the Bronx when she lived in a $15,000 a month Trump Tower apartment until six months ago. This woman probably couldn't even find Sunnyside on a map until she decided to challenge me for the sake of challenging me. She doesn't care about the Bronx. She doesn't care about Queens. She cares about running for running. No one's ever seen this person before. Who are you? Like, where is your family from? No, where have you lived? You are, no one has seen you in this community before. And while I know you have multi-millionaires that finance your campaign and you're financed by the same real estate developers and big banks that would profit from the corruption in Washington and adding one more notch to their belt, I don't think it's important for us to, to do that. I don't think it's okay for us to do that. Uh, Ms. Caruso Cabrera, presumably you want to respond to that. And then I do want to get the final question in. Go ahead. Sure. Greetings from Sunnyside, Queens. I love Sunnyside, Queens. I love New York. I wish I had been born in New York. Unfortunately, I wasn't. Uh, my opponent is the one that nobody ever sees in the district. Let me tell you, the second this crisis started, I started delivering food and I started delivering masks. We went to Rain up on Morris Park Avenue. We went to the Bronx Jewish Community Council up uh, in the northwestern part of the district. I've been to uh, Iglesia de la Familia. I've been to the Vishnu Hindu Bowl. I have delivered nearly 50,000 masks and food and hand sanitizer to Jacoby Hospital, which I'm not sure you could have found on a map, AOC, when this crisis started. <laughs> Every day, when I go out in the community, people tell me, we never see you. They say AOC is MIA. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, do the final question. And I believe our order uh, is that uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez gets it. This uh, district, the 14th district in both the Bronx and Queens is largely an immigrant district. Uh, the president and the GOP have said over and over that Democrats want open borders. There are four Democrats here 
or do any of you support open borders? If not, how would you like to see the nation's immigration policies uh, renewed, revised, and amended? Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, that's for you. Thank you very much. Um, I do not believe in open borders, but I do believe in safe passage. And I believe that our immigrant families deserve to be protected, especially in this time when our president and our hostile uh, Republican administration is attacking and targeting our families at all costs. I do believe that ICE has committed human rights abuses and has a structure that is inherently corrupted. We have to make sure that we take a new approach to immigration, one that is not centered on the marginalization and attacking of our families, but one that is centered in American values of ensuring that families can be reunited. I'm proud, proud to have reunited families that were separated and to take fathers and mothers out of ICE detention to fight for children just just a few weeks ago. Um, at well, excuse me, I, I just want to interject that uh, we are running out of time, so let's keep uh, things as sure. short as I'll end on this. each candidate. I'll end on this. Just a few weeks ago, I was called last minute by a community group that five or five or six children were being transported into LaGuardia Airport into a pandemic zone. And within the drop of a hat, because I am here all the time, because it's not just a campaign line, because this is where my family is. This is where my uncle is. This is where my brother is. This is where my family is. I dropped everything and headed to LaGuardia Airport to get those six kids and follow up and make sure that they were safe. Thank you very much, Ms. Khan. Okay, so I don't believe in open borders. I think borders should be protected. But I also believe right now the DACA recipients are not getting anything. It's been years and we need to protect these these children, these people who are under DACA. Nothing has been done in Congress and that's something we need to um, do quickly. ICE needs to be revamped. There has to be reforms for the ICE because ICE is not doing that is something correctly to the family. And I also want to say that I'm here 22 years in this district. I grew, I, I was, I got married in, in Sunnyside. So I love this district. I know the district very well uh, with the back of my hand, both Bronx in Queens because I ran an organization and that organization is with immigrant families. So we know how hard it is, how immigration needs to be stronger to protect my family who are migrating from this country. So I believe in that thing. Thank you very much, Ms. Caruso Cabrera. We need to have secure borders, but we also need a path to citizenship. I got into this race because I am the daughter and the granddaughter of immigrants. And because of them, I've lived an American dream, and I want people here in Queens and the Bronx to have the same opportunities for that American dream. We've always been a welcoming place for immigrants. Um, AOC says her family lives here. Her mother moved to Florida because the taxes are too high in New York. And AOC, my opponent, voted to raise taxes on New Yorkers. She voted with the Trump administration. Governor Cuomo begged the New York delegation to vote against it, and she voted with the Trump administration, the only one, because once again, she's always divisive and she's always working against the party and against the people she represents. I will okay, never do that. I will always work for them. Thank you very much. Uh, you get the final word on this question, and then we'll do closing comments. Ms. Ocasio Cortez. Um, well, you know, I hope, um, it's my hope that. And it's my belief that you can come after me all you want. Leave my mom out of it. My mother is a widow. My mother is a school secretary that makes an hourly wage that's laid off right now. She doesn't, and you don't know her life. You don't know what she's been through. So please leave my mother out of this. It's really wrong. Now, that being said, I do believe that, that immigration is a top priority for our district. And I think that it's one that our families' lives hinge upon. I, I work so consistently with our district, whether it's Corona, whether it's our, 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 our Bangladeshi brothers and sisters, our family, whether it's our West African family, whether it's our Latino family, uh, family here in, in the district. Got about 15 the, seconds. 
the top uh, casework that we get coming to our office is immigration related. And we have to take a whole system approach because what's happening right now was has been weaponized by the Trump administration. And we have to not just roll back it, but we have to transition to a positive space. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's time now, candidates, for the uh, closing statements. Each of you will have a one minute uh, closing statement uh, by uh, prior agreement. Uh, Michelle Caruso Cabrera gets the uh, first one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. This has been great. I'm asking everyone who's watching tonight to vote for me on June 23rd. The choice is clear. AOC versus MCC. When you get when you vote for MCC, you get unity over divisiveness. You get somebody who's going to work for you and not for her national celebrity. You're going to get someone who would never vote against health care, would never vote against coronavirus testing. I will always be working for you and I will have a constituent services office that actually works. Every immigration attorney I talk to tells me AOC that your office is useless. AOC, you're always MIA, just like you were the crisis. MCC, me, I will always be at your service. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, uh, your turn. It has been the privilege and honor of the lifetime every single day that I wake up to have been trusted by our community and to be trusted by our community to stand up even when it is hardest in Washington. I'm proud to have co-sponsored and, and, and authored legislation that has passed in the United States House of Representatives. And while, while always being true, never giving up, never selling out, while also pushing the bounds of what is possible. That's my job, but that's also our job as one of the most progressive districts in America. I'm proud to serve and be in this community almost every single day that I'm not called to votes in Washington. I'm proud to be able to serve our community and to have an award-winning constituent services office. And I'm proud to continue to fight for healthcare, housing, and education as human rights in the United States of America. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Khan, up to you for the, um, the final word. We also have a statement from uh, Sam Sloan uh, that we will uh, be putting on the screen as well. Ms. Khan. I, I want to tell all my constituents District 14 to so please come out and vote June 23rd. If you're ill, please mail in the ballots because that's very important. That's where you could show your rights and that's what, how we can see who will best fit to run the Congressional District 14. I'm part of you guys. I live here. I'm around all the time. I'm a pragmatic, prog pragmatic, progressive, and I also believe in what the people are looking for. I want to come out and represent you, and I want to feel what is right, and I want to represent the policies. That's what I'm here for, not to attack anybody, because we can attack everyone and one another for a lot of different things that we don't believe in. But I think we should believe in the people who live here, the people who are here all the time, and you know what? After Washington, I come back home to Sunnyside. I come back home to the Bronx. This is who I am, and this is who I'll be, and my children who are growing up here, my niece and nephews, please come out and vote. Thank you. All right, all three candidates who are here and also to Mr. Sloan, who is uh, going to be delivering a um, closing statement, which we are going to put on the screen. Uh, we want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Michelle Caruso-Cabrera, Badran Khan, and I wish you all good health, certainly, during this time, and uh, good luck uh, in your campaigns. And candidates, while you might not agree on everything, I know you will all agree with me that every eligible voter should come out and vote on June 23rd.
Please note that voting can be done, as uh, Ms. Khan mentioned, by absentee ballot. You can visit vote.nyc and you have all the information right there. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the League of Women Voters. For more information, please call the League at 212-725-3541. Our upcoming debates next week, May 25th, it's the 16th Congressional District on June 1st. It's the 15th Congressional District on June 8th. It will be the open seat in the 79th Assembly District in the Bronx. And then on June 15th, we'll hold a debate for the open seat in the 85th Assembly District. So uh, to our viewers, to their constituents, thank you all for watching. And uh, thanks to our great producer, Helen Greenberg. And uh, we'll see you all uh, next week on the Bronx Talk. Good night, everybody.